to incidents. Um, so um, let's move on here. Why am I? Uh, cool. So, all right. So talking about operations here, you know, I think uh, we talk about how uh, enterprises, how they're trying to transform, how their technology organizations work, how they're trying to meet these new digital transformation demands, how they're trying to, you know, be a more responsive and quicker organizations. Um, if you think about the world as sort of a dev and an ops side, right, a build and a run side, developers have had this, this unfair um, advantage, you know, um, oops, sorry, struggling there. There you go. So if you think about it, dev side, op side, trying to get things done, you know, there's been this unfair advantage coming from developers, you know, since like 2001, right? Um, there's been this idea of agile, right? And it's been seeping into their heads. Now, maybe they weren't, people weren't doing agile, but the ideas were out there. They're in the conference speeches, they're in the books, the terminology was shown up in the tools. This whole idea of flow and fast feedback and breaking things down into small, small teams, um, you know, that's been uh, something that's uh, focusing kind of horizontal, on the horizontal flow of, um, of, uh, of work. That's something that's been going on on the dev side of the house for, uh, you know, for years, right? So the, the, this idea has been, has been uh, seeping in there. But on the ops side of the house, you know, what have we got, right? Um, you know, most of what we're still doing today was really baked in the last kind of, you know, intellectual innovation that's happened in operations has been the idea of ITIL, right? Um, you know, this idea of that we have a very kind of siloized, uh, meaning we divide things up by functional, uh, by, by functional capability, you know, the, 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 um, the server admins, the, the, the Linux admins, SIP the Linux admins, the Windows admins, SIP the Windows admins, the storage, the databases, the network, uh, we might even break up the network and the firewall teams. Everybody sits in these individual uh, functional functional areas. We develop these functional capabilities, and then we kind of have you know different functions to um, try to coordinate that work. So, uh, you know, when it comes to thinking about this this how to move in this uh, very dynamic, um, fast feedback way of of working, uh, you know, devs had this 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 uh, this this advantage, right? And uh, now here we are in 2020. And operations is getting squeezed, right? On one side, we've got the go faster, open and open things up, um, go 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 um, requests, right? These are the digital and the DevOps, uh, you know, transformations. At the same time, there's another mandate coming down from the other side, which is often coming from the same people. They're squeezing us in the middle, which is lock it down, right? Don't be the next hack. Don't be the next breach, right? Um, you know, so these two pressures, the two competing pressures, are are. Uh, are squeezing on on uh, onto operations, right? So a uh, bit of a story here, right? So this is uh, based on a real company. This is a real incident. We'll take a few minutes to kind of walk uh, walk through it. Um, but uh, you know, this this company is a household name. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to divulge the name to protect the uh, the not so the not so innocent. But you know, they were doing a great job um, on their uh, these various transformation activity, right? They had a digital transformation going on, an agile transformation, uh, DevOps transformations, you know, and they have a new nascent SRE program, which I, you know, again, I talked about, it's a uh, kind of a rethinking of, of, of what an operation engineer does. Uh, they had all the latest technologies, right? It's cloud, it's Docker, Kubernetes, uh, you know, trying to roll new things out in these microservices architecture. And, uh, you know, they were quite well known for this, right? And they were doing a lot of good, a good work on this, on this side. But what nobody was talking about is, you know, what happens after deployment, right? Everybody was go, 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 fixated on how do we get Kubernetes to production? How do we deploy this new mobile application? But what, what they weren't talking about is what happens day two. What happens, you know, how do you, how do you manage things going, uh, going forward? So um, the story starts, it was just another Tuesday, right? And in the uh, Network Operations Center, um, you know, they, about 9.30 in the morning, they started to see these intermittent um, errors, right? And they're like, ah, did we see the same sort of thing last week? Uh, yeah, but it looks a little bit different. Not really sure here. Maybe we'll just kind of watch it. You know, flash forward a half hour later, uh, this business manager, I, I guess on the phone, I guess, I guess they're running while they're on the phone here. But, uh, you know, they're like, ah, oh, there's a problem. There's a customer impacting outage. We've got to, we, you know, we, uh, we got to do something, right? So the knock springs into action. It's the network operations center. They say escalate, right? You know, and so that's their standard uh, procedure. So um, Bob becomes the incident commander, uh, opens a ticket, right? And you know the, the, they 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 themselves can't pinpoint what actually the uh, the problem is. So the uh, the ticket automatically triggers their incident um, command procedure, which you know sends out this alert to um, to all the app specific SREs, right? The SREs are those 
uh, those new, those newly branded kind of modern ops engineers, right? And they all, they're all the on calls. They show up for these, uh, um, for anything related to that possible that service. And uh, they jump on the bridge call, right? And they get into this kind of try this, then try that, uh, uh, you know, pattern that get into. Now there's certain systems that only have, that, that, that they don't have access to because there's customer data in. So they got to call someone, uh, Steve here from the legacy systems administration team. So now, you know, they're going through this loop trying to figure out, well, is it this, is it that? And lo and behold, you know, the business manager, right? Cause uh, they're pretty savvy found the, uh, of course they found their way to get the phone number for the bridge call. So now they're on the bridge call going, is it fixed? Is it fixed? Right. Interrupting, uh, interrupting everybody. Um, and so now they finally realize, well, huh, there's this new service or this food service. There's a problem with it. Right. Um, and so they asked the on call for the food service, like, uh, you know, do you know what's, what's going on? Can you fix it? And the, uh, the foo SRE is like, well, no, right. I, I, uh, it's brand new, it's newly containerized, uh, it's moving fast, I'm not sure exactly what, what, what the problem is. We're gonna have to get the food dev team uh, involved, right? So now it's noon, right? Remember to start at, at, at 9.30 in the morning and uh, they update the ticket and they're like, well, we need the foo lead dev, right? Um, and so, you know, ding, uh, it's going off in the, uh, the inbox of Karen, right? And Karen is part of these new cool DevOps, you know, agile teams. She sits in the new building, right? It's got the fancy offices, the open, open floor plan. Uh, she's, you know, uh, working on a sprint. She's locked in. She's got her earphones in. She's, you know, sipping her tea. And is just ignoring everything, right? Because she's on her sprint and doesn't want to, doesn't want the home stretch and doesn't want to be um, interrupted. Finally, you know, knock, knock. It's, you know, the her manager who gets escalated to says, hey, uh, Karen, do you see that ticket? She's like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll take a look. Now, if you notice down here, there's this context wagon, right? And this is kind of something that's endemic to um, this very ticket-driven way of, of working in operations is that, you know, as these tickets get routed, as these incidents go on, more and more people um, get added to these tickets. And even if they're not actively involved, they're just sort of CC'd, right? It's occupying a little bit of their, of their brain, right? So we call this the context wagon because it's eating up a little of their, of their brain power. You're going to see this kind of grow as we, uh, as we go here. So Karen's like, okay, I'll, all right, fine. I'll, I'll take a look at this. Right, so Karen checks out the ticket and looks at it and says, ah, I'm gonna need a lot more information here. Um, you know, so she updates the ticket saying I need these, these, uh, these logs. Lucky for Karen, she knows kind of a back door. She knows the, uh, where the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the Slack channel that these, uh, these systems administrators uh, hang out in, right? And so she's like, hey, can someone help me with the access to this foo service and the prod one environment uh, for this particular ticket? Um, so of course, you know, uh, Lee, this the system in here just springs next and says, sure, I can help you out. And here's the logs, right? And now, you know, how many people think this would be a show of hands if I was there, right? How many people think that Lee got the logs right on the first time, right? Of course not, right? And not by Lee's fault, which is that communication issue. So Lee and Karen got to go around and around, you know, a few laps to figure out uh, what logs exactly that, um, that she needs because we don't trust Karen to actually access that environment because it's got production, uh, you know, production data in it. So finally, it's now two o'clock in the afternoon, right? And Karen goes, um, uh, all right, look at these logs. Huh, this is bizarre. Like who started the, restarted these services and why? Um, for all these containers, right? It's all Dockerized now. Uh, they didn't use the correct environment variables, right? So we're gonna have these weird brownouts, I think, uh, until we restart this entire service pool uh, with the correct environment variables, right? So now, again, two o'clock in the afternoon, ticket update to the middleware team. Hey, with this urgent restart, we got to update this entire app pool with the correct, um, the correct environment variables, right? Well, now it's 2.30 in the afternoon, right? And Melissa, the middleware manager, sees this and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, are you crazy? Like, it's the middle of the day. You know, we, these, are, these are customer impacting services. Uh, you need to have business approval, right? Because we've been burned by this before, right? So now the context wagon's growing even bigger here. Uh, Bob's got to up update the ticket. Bob needs to get the approval of the SVP of the line of uh, uh, the line of business. And um, that's Susan, right? And, you know, Susan tries hard, she tries to keep up with things, but she's busy with customers, with vendors, with, you know, human management, dealing with the business. And uh, she gets pulled out of a meeting by her chief of staff and is like, hey, we need to do this, this, ups, this, this, this restart. Otherwise, um, this segment of customers are experiencing a problem right now. We're going to keep having problems. So she says, well, what's the, what's the impact? So, you know, what, is, what does Susan do? Well, Susan, Susan um, is, gonna, is gonna pull her, her VPs, right? And says, hey, is this, is this something that's, that's dangerous, right? And they're like, hey, it's a web restart, right? You know, how you're restarting some web services, 
um, it's pretty low risk, you know, why don't we uh, go ahead and do it? Now, granted, these VPs, you know, they're four or five degrees away from the keyboard. They haven't touched a keyboard except for email in, 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 quite, in quite a while. Um, but they're thinking, hey, it's a web service. How bad can it, how bad can it be? So now it's five o'clock at night. Our context wagon's growing even bigger. And they're like, well, the restart is approved, right? And um, so, ding, great, let's get it done. So Melissa, the middleware manager, gets her approval and says, well, who knows these production services the best, right? And they go, oh, well, that's, uh, that's Ellen, right? Well, where's Ellen? Oh, gee, we just, it's a true story now. We just put Ellen on a plane to the European office to help launch a new, a new, a new, a new partner, uh, a new partner service, right? So now it's like, oh, gee, so who's the, who's the next best person that we can, that we can put in, in charge here, right? Well, uh, you know, uh, I guess Scott, right? Well, Scott's pretty new. Scott's only been there for a few, uh, um, uh, uh, for, for a couple months. So he's like, I don't really know these services and they keep changing them. So uh, now the context wagon's bigger. Spotlight's going on to Scott. It's going to save us. So Scott goes into the um, uh, SharePoint server. He's into the, the wiki. You know, he's looking at different documentations. Uh, he's basically doing the dumpster diving right through anything he can find to make sure he knows everything about these services before he, you know, rolls up his sleeve and gets to work. He feels comfortable finally. And he's like, I think I know what's going on here. So um, he just starts, you know, restarting these, uh, uh, these, these services, you know, and now, you know, about a few minutes later, there's this bar service complaining, waiting for Acme service, right? And he's like, what's the bar service? Worse, what's the Acme service, right? Now 10 minutes goes by and suddenly, you know, Acme startup failed, right? Uh, actually bar service, we startup failed. Uh, Acme you know, I uh, can't find this Acme, uh, this Acme service, right? So now at six o'clock in the evening, right? And Scott's going, oh, come on now. Why, what's going on? Why is this not working? Uh, you know, is it suddenly uh, getting hot in here? <laughs> you know, why, hey, uh, can I just turn the air conditioning on? Um, you know, so Scott's panicked now and is like, hey, this bar app startup timed out. Air says we can't connect to the Acme service. Uh, I looked at Acme, but it seems like it's running. Um, is the air message correct? Why can't bar connect? Right, so the emergency kind of pull in the bar uh, on on call for the bar service, um, and uh, Linda shows up and says, "Ah, well, you know, this is actually part of our new DevOps program, right? We have this environment pre-flight check, which um, is which prevents the startup if you can't connect to all the dependent resources. Uh, looks like Bar's connection to the Acme service is being blocked, right? And so now the context wagon's getting bigger. All the spotlights on here." Uh, they update, they update the tickets now 645 at night. Remember the start at 930 in the morning. Uh, they say, Hey, there's this urgent connection issue between bar and Acme, right? And they add the, the network on call and the lead dev for the bar team. Uh, the bar app, um, uh, developer gets back to them first and is like, Hey, you know, I can comment out the test, but you know, my CD pipeline, my continuous delivery pipeline only goes to QA. Uh, if we want to go from QA to production, I'd have to get the change management folks involved and don't even really know the process. We're going to have to, you know, get them going on this as well. Uh, so they go, okay, well, forget that path, right? That's probably not going to happen in time. So let's focus on the network. Let's focus on fixing that network connection, right? So by now the business managers, a little interlude here, the business managers are figuring out that their services are going down, right? That now what started as a small isolated customer incident is actually growing to, uh, to infect a wide swath of, uh, of the business. And, um, so they start calling the middleware managers saying, well, what's, what's going on here, right? What's, what's, uh, what's happening? You know, why, why you're screwing up here? In an epic bout of finger pointing, what does she do? She goes, it's the network, right? It's their fault. So the business managers call the network managers and they said, your network is broken. And they're like, don't worry, we're on it, right? Well, lo and behold to them, um, there's another network issue going on, an actual network issue <laughs> that's, that's happening. It's not a major one, but the VPs are now screaming out the, uh, the network SREs, lock everything else out. Don't answer anyone else's phone call. The priority is fixing this, uh, this problem, right? So now they're not really answering the calls for uh, this other actual uh, outage problem, right? So luckily Scott, remember said he was new. Um, so he had done this uh, as part of this, the organization does this welcome thing where you meet different people from different teams. And luckily he had beer, uh, beers uh, the week before with um, Carlos, a director from the network, uh, from the network team. So he still had his cell phones. We called him. He's like, Hey, you know, it's Scott. Uh, can you help us out here? Right. And we're kind of dead in the water and, and everyone says that they're working on something else. So finally they get the, uh, the network SRE um, uh, to show up and says, Oh, well, you know, the firewall is blocking the traffic, right? You're going to have to take that up with the firewall team, right? There's an internal firewall between these different container services. 
And so they opened a ticket for the firewall team, right? It's now seven something at night. Context wagon's getting bigger, right? Everybody's sweating. Uh, customers are mad. And they said, well, you know, we got this urgent firewall uh, update, right? So they paged the on-call um, for the uh, um, firewall team. Freddie, the firewall engineer, shows up and he's like, hey, it can't be the firewall, right? We, have, we only change our firewalls once a week on Thursdays. Today's Tuesday. Uh, this problem, it doesn't make sense. This problem would suddenly pop up, uh, pop up now. Um, so finally they had to convince them, no, there was, a, you know, that there's a, that this restart hasn't happened since that last Tuesday. So what's going on? They said, well, oh, okay, I'll look. And he said, well, there was a rule change last Thursday that would stop Barr from talking to Acme. Um, Scott's like, well, can you change it back? And uh, Freddie, of course, is like, sure, if you fill out the right request ticket on Thursday, we'll make sure, like, you know, the chief of staff luck is on the call. Is like, Freddie, we got customers calling. The SVPs are, you know, and, and, and SVPs are livid. Uh, it's supposed to be a safe change. We got to do something here, right? So Freddie puts in for the, uh, the emergency, uh, you know, firewall rule change, right? Um, this emergency change. It pages the NetSec um, uh, automatically, the NetSec uh, on call who says, whoa, it's, you know, it's nine o'clock at night now, right? And they're like, whoa, this is a production change. I'll have to get others, uh, you know, three out of five cab members have to approve this change and, and everyone starts arguing. And then luckily the chief of staff said the, uh, uh, the magic words, I'm gonna call Susan, the SVP, <laughs> right? And next thing you know, ding, firewall rule change uh, is approved, it's 9.30 at night, um, context wagons getting bigger, bigger and bigger. And, um, you know, uh, so finally the firewall team, the middle, middleware team, um, the, the network team, they get together and they kind of go through this rolling cycle of they change the firewall rule, make sure everything looks good, go into the rest of the restarts. And they're like, I think we were good. We're good. Right. And, and everyone's like, well, you think, what do you mean? Aren't, aren't we, aren't we back? It's like, well, it seems like it, but we had this policy change because we had some bad processes in the past where, um, <coughs> only, um, you know, where only this customer engagement team has the tools to test our APIs to make sure that the work has been done properly because we don't trust our people to do it properly. So, all right, well, we got to get the, the, the on-call. Who is, who is the customer engagement manager, right? Well, we don't have an on-call. So who is the, who's the manager? Well, it's Varsha. Where's Varsha? True story, it was Varsha's birthday, right? So Varsha is out at dinner, 11 o'clock at night with her, uh, with her friends, enjoying herself, has to go home to log in to run these customer engagement uh, uh, these API tests, they don't, they don't trust anybody else to, uh, to run. Varsha comes home, quickly starts running through these things. Uh, all, all looks good. Updates a ticket, API is okay. Runs back to her own, her own birthday party. And uh, Scott, the middleware manager, uh, um, finally updates a ticket and says, you know, it's 1130 at night, service is restarted. All okay. The knock says, well, I guess everything looks, looks green. I guess we can close the, uh, the ticket now. And, uh, you know, finally, right. Remember to start at nine 30 in the morning, went to 1130 at, at, uh, at night and the very next day, right. This is the kicker, right? So Susan quite upset because the heat she took from customers calls her in together and is like, well, whose fault is this? Right. Why are we so bad at change? What additional processes and approvals are you going to add? So this never happens again. Right. And everyone just kind of hangs their head realizing that this is exactly how they got in the problem, in the problem in the, uh, in the first place. Right. So later, and this is, this is not an uncommon occurrence. This thing's kind of outages happened all the time, right? And they, and they sometimes happen multiple at a time, right? And, you know, they finally after, um, you know, kind of uh, a year, almost two years of this, their transformation efforts, uh, the executive team got together and says, hey, look, we've invested in cloud, agile, DevOps, containers, right? Um, you know, Kubernetes, right? All, you know, why is everything still taking too long and costing too much, right? And, you know, someone kind of finally realized that, yeah, because our transformation is largely ignored operations. We operate software um, to make our money. We don't write software to make our money. That's just a necessary part of it. But we largely ignore the thing that we do to make our money, which is looking at how we transform our, our, uh, our operations. So that's the end, of the, uh, <laughs> the end of the story. And, you know, we see this time and time again, which is large companies, they're large, they, they, on the operation side, they keep chasing the symptoms, right? And through these kinds of processes, they're, 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 they're um, you know, they're constantly failing. This has been, you know, decades of the same type of opening tickets, you know, working in silos, um, you know, uh, having these different conflicts and miscommunication. And the conventional wisdom to fix it is always kind of the same things, right? It's like, oh, we need better tools, right? Because, you know, we had CF Engine, and then we had, 
and then we had Puppet, and then we had Chef, and well, we had Blade Logic before that, and now we have Ansible, and now we're going to Kubernetes, right? It's the next tools always promised us to, to, to get us out of this quagmire, and it never really, it never does. Um, we need more people, right? That's, that's another old kind of bromide, right? It's just, well, first of all, if we can even find those people, right, that would be, uh, that would be great. But the business model doesn't suggest that. Like companies don't want more people to do the same amount of work. They want more people to do even more work or do more work with the same amount of, the same amount of, uh, of people. And as I mentioned, hiring talent for this kind of talent is just almost impossible these days, right? So, um, uh, you know, you know, if we could find the people, it wouldn't, it wouldn't get us to where we need to, uh, to be. Um, this one's one of my favorite, right? We need more discipline and attention to detail. Uh, to me, this is like telling developers write less bugs, right? It just doesn't, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. So, you know, look at it and say, oh, well, this is operations fault because they aren't disciplined or they don't, or they don't have attention to detail, um, uh, you know, I think is a very toxic uh, attitude to take. And then obviously the one in this story, uh, you know, we need more change reviews, approvals, right? That we end up building the scar tissue, that something bad happened at some point. So we add some layer of bureaucracy on, on top of it. And then that bureaucracy doesn't work. So we add more bureaucracy on top of it. And next thing you know, you know, we're causing these problems with more bureaucracy and trying to add more bureaucracy on top of the bureaucracy to say, to solve the bureaucracy. Right. So, so we get these, uh, you know, we call it like an organizational scar tissue that builds up to where nothing works, nothing moves, everything takes too long and costs too much and still breaks, uh, breaks too often. So, you know, kind of my thesis here of telling this story and kind of pointing this out is that, we really need to challenge the conventional wisdom about how operations work gets, uh, uh, gets done. And, um, you know, there's kind of these four forces here, this low trust, right? Uh, excessive toil, toil meaning the repetitive tasks that don't add value to the, um, uh, don't add enduring value to the company, probably could be automated, things we do time and time again. Imagine like moving the pile of dirt from one side of, the, uh, uh, of, of a lot to the other and back and forth. Um, silos, right? Working in, in, in a disconnected, you know, manner. Like I do part one part, you do the other part. Dutch does the other part. Um, yet somehow they have to all uh, all coordinate. And then queues, right? This idea that we're opening tickets and sitting in queues, and um, you know, working in in a disconnected manner through these these uh, uh, you know through the, these ticket systems. Now, you know, rather than kind of digging in um, to each of these today, it's kind of a longer uh, presentation. I actually gave this talk at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, this is from 2018. Um, you can watch it on YouTube. I kind of go through each of these, uh, these, these, these four. I call them the four horsemen. The four, you know, kind of the four horsemen of the operations apocalypse. Um, and they're really these are natural occurring forces that organizations have to, you know, have to dig up, uh, to dig up against. So um, you can go ahead and watch that 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 talk um, if you want to hear more about kind of unpacking that whole story and why all those things, um, you know, what all the different forces are that led to those to those problems. Um, but the uh, next thing I want to move on to is really kind of zeroing in on one part of this, which is incident management. Now, but before I do that, I can't see the audience. So I have no idea. Does, um, does everybody asleep? People awake? Anybody have any questions? Um, John, I don't know if, uh, uh, if you want to say anything or let me really just keep going. <laughs> no, they, they, everybody's been paying attention. So, um, I've taken a picture, but I'll turn the camera and show you what the... <laughs> That's right. I trust everyone's awake. But, you know, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Or does this feel familiar to anybody? Does anybody kind of, you know, working in, you know, the... Uh, there, uh, there are a lot of gaps for people who recognize the, the pain that you're talking about. Any questions from anyone? No? You can ask me and I'll do it. I'll be the one to look silly. I don't yeah. mind. What was the what was the punchline since there was no change but there was a change to the firewall? The, the question was what's the punchline because there was a change but there wasn't a change to the firewall. Yeah, right. I mean, it's 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 just one of these like everybody was doing their job and it's it's just how you know there's this. Um, I mean, the punch what actually was the cause of the outages in that, in that scenario was the multiple ones. So it was that they had. Somebody, they were starting to deprecate one of those services, either Acme or the bar service. Um, and nobody told the app team that was writing the startup tests. And uh, at the, so that service was still out there, but, but the, network, the security team got a, or the, or the firewall team got word that that service was, that connection between those two services was no longer needed. I think they're using Istio or one of those uh, um, 
uh, service mesh type things. And so they just removed the connection between those two, um, those two, uh, those two services. Um, but the service was still there and no one told the team that worked on the other service that they needed to change that startup test. Um, so that was what got things into a hung state. Um, but before that, it was also this idea that, oh, you know, like the hubris of, oh yeah, let's just restart this in the middle of the day. It's just a web service. How bad can it be? Right. And the fact that the people that were proving the change and were saying that it was, it was a safe change really had no idea, right. That they were that far, this is sort of that low, that low trust, uh, you know, problem that, that they needed to escalate up to these VPs who were so far from the keyboard, they didn't really know. They're going on basically uh, an older theory of like, oh yeah, you know, bouncing a web service is no big, is no big deal. Um, but, you know, they saw that then, then you have this, you know, unfortunate situation, things get locked up and you have this cascading failure. Uh, so people working in silos, you know, all the work going through these, these ticket queues, so people were, didn't have the context of other people's, other people's work. Um, and, you know, the organization was very much buried in this kind of excessive toil where people, you know, couldn't focus on the bigger picture because they were kind of buried in their day-to-day day-to-day uh, -day tasks. Uh, was there another? Cool. All right. Any other? One more. And yeah, uh, Chuba. I think Chuba wrote in the task. Yes, I, I can. Um, I'll add that that link to the YouTube uh, presentation before. Uh, you can Google for it, but I'll I'll add it into the presentation before I give it to John. Okay. And uh, one of our questions from the back was, was this incident, did this incident all happen before Slack? Uh, yeah, I think I, 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 I threw out, uh, no, well, they, they had, they had a, they used HipChat at the time. I couldn't remember the name. <laughs> That's why I, was, I said Slack. It wasn't actually Slack. Um, it was an Atlassian HipChat shop at the time, but like most enterprises, the chat systems were, you know, team-based, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the old legacy sysadmin team, they had their, and a lot of the ops folks kind of, they had their own hip chat, um, but they didn't, it was set up per team. So like each team purchased their own and run it. It wasn't a company wide, um, a company wide thing. Um, and yeah. So it was like Slack, but not. Slack. It's the precursor to Slack. Yeah. It's a hip chat. Yeah, exactly. It was a silo Slack. Right, which still happens a lot too, right? I mean, they, you know, corporate wide, corporate wide IM um, is is not that prevalent yet. And if it is, people don't really pay attention to it because it's too much noise, right? They just kind of, oh, okay, you know. And you don't know who to, you do, and the problem with the, with the silos is you don't know who to call, right? You don't know who are the people on the other end that we I need to talk to about this. Um, even if I knew what to ask, I don't know who to ask, right? And you said these kinds of incidents happen in time and time again. So you can't just, Hey, I got a problem, right? Well, and then we would <laughs> fill the, the company wide slack with, Hey, I got a problem would be filled up all day long. Right. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a bit about incident management for a uh, turn over to, uh, to Dutch. Right. So, you know, this whole last mile talk, it, it's kind of, there's a lot of, theory to it, right? There's a lot of like looking at the forces that undermine operations and kind of understanding, well, you know, what's, what's getting our way and how do we, how do we, um, you know, how do we clear that? But it's, it's, it's tough to make that actionable, right? It's more of a culture, uh, a culture change, but you know, the incident management is something that, that is, you can work on, um, and, you know, be very tactical about and start to really improve, uh, improve change. And, you know, why, you know, why do we see, uh, a lot of organizations now starting to focus heavily on incident management when in the past they did, they really, they really didn't. Right. Um, you know, they, and what we, we see is that number one, um, you know, this is becoming the front line of their business, right. That, that operating software based services is their business now. Right. And, uh, or the, the revenue, you know, generation depends fully on these software based services. So that's, that's number one. And then they look at it as well, Hey, you know, if operations is our business, um, detecting, diagnosing, and resolving incidents, it's the true measure, right, of how good we are at our operational capabilities, right? How, how in control are we? If, um, uh, you know, uh, how well are we instrumented? How well are we able to, to uh, you know, figure out what's going wrong? And how, are, how, how, much, how much control do we have over our, uh, uh, over our infrastructure? And, you know, why now? Um, kind of three main things going on. One is complexity, right? I don't know if you've seen these yeah, they're pretty cool. If you Google like uh, microservices uh, Death Star, um, 
there's some folks that created these, these, these visualization tools that map all the microservices in an org, in, 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 in an application stack and um, draw their connections right between, between them. Um, so, you know, it used to be, Hey, you could kind of keep a network architecture or a, or a, a application map in your head, right. Or on a whiteboard somewhere. And uh, you know, the reality is that uh, this is kind of think just a pretty minor level, um, you know, uh, gig economy uh, service. I'm not sure who exactly it was, but this was from I think Cornell uh, University uh, kind of built this tool and was doing this this uh, this mapping. But the idea that you can keep in your head is almost impossible, right? So the complexity of these services, especially when you start to figure in the um, uh, you know the user traffic and all the things that are out of your control now, right? A lot of stuff's happening in the cloud where there's all kinds of issues that and and uh, you know properties of these services that you're really not in control of and maybe not even be the, that documented that well. So Complexity is, 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 is off the charts. The consequence is off the, uh, is off the charts as well, right? We're, you know, what we're, the work we're doing is, is increasing in consequence um, to both, you know, not only financial success of organizations, but also health and safety, right? Um, you know, think about how much of our lives is being ruled by IoT and these other, um, or gonna be ruled by IoT and these other services. So high complexity, high consequence, and then high speed, right? All this DevOps, SRE, Agile, right? It's all about how do we get from an idea to where it's in production making us money as fast as fast as possible. So these three forces going together, um, you know, it's going to produce incidents where we know that we cannot control, you know, that failure is going to happen. How do we respond to it is, is, uh, um, is what, really, uh, what really matters. So in talking about incident management, I, I think it's something that's kind of happening kind of quietly throughout the industry and is starting to pick up speed is that there's a lot of both practic practical um, and academic um, um, interest in how do we, uh, you know, how do we detect, diagnose, and 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 repair these these services, especially considering you know how high consequence they're um, they're becoming. So I'm going to reference a bunch of people that kind of I'm standing on their uh, on their shoulders uh, through uh, throughout this, and also I have a, a longer form of this part of the presentation too, so I can provide you guys with a link to. Uh, to that. So first a quick, you know, definition, right? Cause everyone's got a different definition. What is an incident, right? And an incident, there is the classic sense, right? Which is an unplanned disruption, right? That, oh, there's some disruption, whether it's an outage or, <clears throat> excuse me, a performance issue um, that's impacting, uh, you know, impacting our, our, uh, our customers, right? That is the most classic kind of ITIL uh, influence that it's about, you know, things that go wrong for our, our customers. Um, and these are outages, this is service degradation. But also I wanna add in here that impact our business operations, right? That these could be work interruptions, uh, you know, failed environments or, um, you know, kind of stop work type things that, that uh, also short notice requests, right? Uh, can also be considered an incident, which is often, you know, considered a, uh, <clears throat> one of those things where it, 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 it's a euphemism for nobody told me until now, <laughs> right? And uh, the issue is all of these things pile up and impact people's work, which then piles up and impacts and, and can, you know, and, and impacts our, our customers, right? So when I talk about incidents, I'm talking about both, you know, the classic outages and service degradation, and also these kind of work interruptions and short notice, uh, short notice requests. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's, you know, there, there's a lot kind of going on in the background, um, you know, what's kind of what's going on um, in the, uh, the, the context of now where we're, we're working in. Again, I got a longer presentation. I'll provide you guys a link to that that talks through, you know, kind of each of these in detail. But, you know, things like the DevOps and SRE transformation, um, actually it's all being driven by the digital transformation, right? That people want the, uh, you know, from a board level, we got to move faster. Everything's, everything's got to be integrated. It's got to be available on all the devices. It's got to be very, you know, we have to be very responsive to our customers and business needs, which kind of drove us, drove us to these cloud native and, 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 and microservices um, technologies to get that flexibility and speed, um, which has been this right, which was, has, has driven us to have this DevOps and SRE uh, uh, um, uh, ways of working to try to, you know, also uh, transform how we, how we work. But I think the most interesting when it has to do with incidents is this idea of um, acknowledging complexity, right? Um, that we're going we're to accept that failure is going to happen, right? But how do we account for that and minimize the downtime? We want to accept the failure, but we don't want to accept, accept, uh, accept downtime. And I think you'll see, uh, you know, there's various people that have kind of uh, joined forces with the academic side of the world, right? Looking at things like, uh, you know, uh, aircraft disasters and nuclear power plant meltdowns and, you know, um, operating room um, 
uh, you know, mistakes. And, uh, you know, they're really analyzing our world, saying that we're no longer in a deterministic world, that we can look at, remember that big Death Star, uh, you know, diagram that I, had, uh, that I had showed. We're no longer in the ability to say, ah, I know exactly what's going to happen, that, you know, A plus B is going to equal, it's going to equal C. In these large complex systems, uh, we really can't predict the outcome. We can't break down that Death Star diagram and perfectly say, well, just because I understand the parts, I'm going to understand how they're all going to interact. Uh, together, so we're kind of dealing in this this high world of um, of complexity, and when you see folks who are kind of pushing the the, the edge here, so Paul Reed is one of the researchers at working at Netflix. Uh, Charity Majors is another person who's uh, came out of Facebook has been working on these types of problems. Um, they notice that the more you invest in resiliency, the more you invest in 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 uptime, um, the weirder the problems get. Right. And they realize that these distributed complex systems, they have an infinite list of almost impossible failure scenarios. Right. Um, you know, meaning that uh, there was a great one they had, I think, was from uh, Charity Talks about from, from Facebook, where there's an issue where, you know, DNS uses UDP. Um, but if the DNS uh, at the payload is larger than the UDP packet size allowed, it fails over to TCP, which is fine. And that's how it works. And a lot of people now communi you know, communicate a lot of information via D DNS. But they had some problem where there was some Eastern European ISP that had hacked their routers to not, to, not, to not allow that failover for some performance reason. And because of that, there was some uh, network latency, some connection, connection issues that actually snowballed and killed some, um, some major database service, got, got hung on it, and took down part of their platform, right? So again, it's one of these weird things that it's an almost impossible thing. How would you ever test for that, right? Um, so we have to accept that failure is going to uh, is going to happen. And there's this great paper um, called uh, "How Complex Systems Fail" by Richard Cook, who is not a computer scientist. He is a anesthesi is a practicing anesthesiologist and one of the foremost um, safety researchers in the world. Kind of person that gets called in by the government and there's big big disasters. And if you read this paper, it'll uh, it's very short. It's like five pages. It goes bullet by bullet. It will basically show you all the ways that complex systems fail. And you're going to look at that and go, wow, okay, well, yeah, <laughs> my systems are going to fail. There's no way really to, to avoid it. Um, it's a really a fascinating, um, fascinating, fascinating look at it. And what's really going on here is that these, um, uh, you know, we're bringing in these ideas that have existed in, uh, you know, so aircraft, nuclear power plants, healthcare, um, and these researchers, Woods, Cook, Decker, you know, Decker is an airline pilot and an academic, Woods is a, uh, one of the is the probably the you know, preeminent academic in this area. Cook, you know, practicing anesthesiologist. They're taking these lessons and they're realizing that hey, you know, this world we live in, this you know, these digital services are becoming kind of a, another type of high consequence uh, system. Um, you know, whether it's economic or societal or even or even life and uh, life and death. So they're taking a lot of their practices and applying them towards um, uh, towards resiliency and even something like incident management. So I highly recommend looking into those practices. It's kind of head scratching stuff, but it's very, uh, it's very interesting. So, but what I want to talk about is the actual, what's going, what's, what's, what are the advances and what are people working on when they, when they, when they actually are breaking down their incident management life cycle and, um, you know, and, and, and trying to improve their, their techniques. Uh, if you think about an incident as a life cycle, right? So, um, we got this kind of observe phase, figure out what's going on. We got this react phase, right? Let's go and actually and actually do something. And maybe we have to do this multiple times. It might be a kind of a loop up here, but eventually uh, we'll solve the problem. Then we're in the learn phase, right? And then we're right back to where we have to spot the problem, solve solve the problem. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of an OODA loop. Um, it's very fascinating. It was first theorized by um, actually a, um, a military a military uh, theorist. Uh, Colonel John Boyd is one of the best aircraft uh, dogfighting pilots and instructors um, uh, in military history. And this is his first drawing of this idea of an OODA loop. But the idea is you're always, you know, you're observing the problem, you're orientating yourself to the problem, to, 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 to say for, you know, the, the person you're dogfighting against, uh, you're orientating yourself to the, the information that you're seeing, uh, you're making a decision, right? And then there's some action that's being, that's being taken. And that provides feedback loops to the observation, the orientation, decision, action. And um, the purpose of the OODA loop is whoever in a tactical situation, like, you know, you know uh, person A versus person B in some type of scenario, whoever can get into that loop faster um, is, uh, um, 
uh, has the distinct advantage, right? And this is why the, the military is so, is so interested in this OODA loop idea. So if we think about it, um, you know, we have a very similar situation of like us versus the incident, right? How do we get into that loop where we're observing um, at the point of action here, we have to orientate ourselves to what we're observing. We have to make a decision. We have to, we have to go ahead and take action. So it's kind of patterned after this, uh, this, this OODA loop. And you'll see companies kind of focusing in on these different, whether it's by, um, uh, by choice or not, they're focusing in on these different, these different phases. So let's talk about what's, what's going on out there. So there's monitoring. We've known that for years, right? I'm sure that's, that's, that's the thing that um, we all love talking about. Uh, you go to any conference, there's never a shortage of people that want to talk about, uh, talk about monitoring. But monitoring is really about spotting the knowns, right? It's about looking for patterns of things that happened in the past. And remember what we talked about with, uh, you know, Charity Major's quote there, that in this complex distributed world, there's this endless number of almost impossible failure scenarios, things we never could have dreamed up, right? So if we're always looking in the past, uh, we're never going to see the next outage, right? It might smell a little bit like it, but most likely it's going to be different enough that how do we actually, you know, it's almost impossible to look in the past and predict these new, these new types of, uh, of failures. So there's this kind of new, new kid on the block here, which is this notion of observability, right? Which is all about how do we interrogate the unknowns? How do we instrument our systems so that in the heat of the moment, when things start to go wrong, how can we ask questions of our system and understand what's actually, of these distributed complex systems, what's actually uh, going on and give us an idea of what we can do to, uh, to fix it. And so observability really gets broken down into these three areas. Logging, right? We've all known about that for a while, um, but it really focuses on the, on structured logging, machine readable logging, right? And logging records the event for us. That's how we actually get the detail of, of the, uh, of the event. Now imagine that in that, in, in that Death Star diagram, right? That logging's happening everywhere. So these little tiny events are all over, all over the place, right? Then we have the next kind of leg of observability, which is metrics, right? Which are really all about data points over time. Now, the problem with metrics is we've lost all context of the event, right? We just have a, a stream of, um, you know, numbers or you know, colors, whatever, just temperatures. And, uh, but you know, that's important for spotting trends, right? To know that is something going up, is something going down, sideways, left, right, good, bad, whatever it might be. So that brings us to kind of the third piece, which is really the, the hardest thing to do in these distributed kind of complex environments is, is tracing, right? So it's understanding the events in the context of a single request, right? The request from the outside of that Death Star, how does that happen across and, and, um, and just let me see all the events in the context of that single, that single um, request. So if you're looking for folks who, you know, are, are not just trying to sell products, but also, you know, are, are kind of great, you know, sort of theorists and practitioners in this space, Charity Majors uh, works for Honeycomb IO. Um, Adrian Cole um, is the leader of the uh, Zipkin uh, distributed tracing uh, open source, um, open source project. Anybody who's been involved in the cloud for a long time probably has seen uh, Adrian's uh, Adrian's work, but great, to, you know, a lot of work is going into this observability um, space. Also, likewise, um, this is a very enterprise specific, specific issue, but um, if you noticed in all of those, um, in that, that story I told earlier, there's all these approval steps. There's all these people that need to weigh in to say, yes, this is good, this is bad, this is in compliance, out of compliance. And a lot of that is this, um, is this attestation, right? That, oh, we have a control. We follow the control. Somebody's attesting that that control was, was, was followed. And you'll see a lot of uh, interesting financial services company are pushing hard to rethink that and automate um, that attestation, right? How do you actually make it so you can write tests and the tests are the things that do the governance, right? Because in this idea that the super complex world, remember that Death Star, and then there's that speed, right? Of everything's got to go fast, you know, faster and faster. There's no way a human being can look at that, keep in their head and say, yes, no, up, down, right? That's how we get that issue where, uh, you know, the highest paid person in the room really can't judge whether a change is good or bad, or really can't judge if, um, if that's the right move or not. Um, and so the idea of kind of trying to automate as much of that process to where we're using a lot of these testing techniques to, uh, to do that attestation. Um, in fact, uh, John Willis, um, a former colleague of mine is doing a lot of, now he's at, he's at Red Hat, he's in the kind of the CTO transformation department, um, has been doing a lot of work trying to get this organized in the industry. Um, IT Revolution Press did this uh, DevOps automated governance reference architecture, which is really done, it was uh, Capital One, Nike, uh, a few other kind of large 
organizations, I uh, can't remember all right now, weighed in on this and uh, produced this uh, paper. You can get it for free on the IT Revolution site. But a very enterprise specific thing, but it's, uh, it's an interesting um, part of the observability. Why? Because in the past, these things would live in silos. But now the idea is all three of these legs, the monitoring, the observability, and the governance, need to be automated to the point where we can distribute them to everybody, where everybody has a visibility into the current state and are things good, bad, in compliance, out of compliance, what's going on with our, with, with our, with our system. So it's not just instrumenting the world to provide these three layers, but it's also this new push towards distributing that to where it becomes you know, uh, kind of a common knowledge that we can all work against uh, in an organization. And then uh, the incident command side is very interesting. We see what's, what's happening, and this has been going on for a while now, is um, people are taking what goes on in the real world, right? So FEMA um, has this incident command system that's really built for you know, wildfires, floods, natural disasters, right? And how do you um, how do you manage those and recover from those those uh, those incidents? And we see uh, Jesse Robbins, who started at at Amazon. He was their I mean, his little job title was called Master of Disaster. It was all about uh, you know back in the early days of Amazon creating disasters. Right? They would do game days. They would um, you know meaning they would simulate a, a disaster. He also got to the point where they were actually causing outages uh, to see how the how the organization would uh, would react to it. It's a very advanced move, but it's a uh, it's a fascinating one. Brent Chapman uh, is now at Slack. Uh, Ernest Mueller, Matt Stratton um, is at PagerDuty. A whole bunch of folks at PagerDuty are working on doing what people are doing individually in the industry, taking these command procedures and translating them to our digital domain. They've actually published it as an open source project, so they actually take their their incident response documentation based on this um, incident command system and their customers as well and they've created as an open source project that anybody can you know can copy and and uh and uh um contribute to and also there's this kind of a, 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 a different uh we see these two kind of two moves going on now well how do we how do we get our people in the right position right and um you know the first kind of move of this dev of this devops transformation was well, let's put dev and ops together right so uh, this is the T-shirt from the very first DevOps days in the U.S., right? It was that uh, that '90s song, right? Ops who are you know, but using ops and devs, right? Ops who are devs who like devs to be ops, who like ops when like their devs, who do dev like their ops, right? It's the idea that we're going to be blending these roles of development and uh, and operations. That's gone on for a while, and then we've and then you know uh, these high performing organizations are figuring out well, you know, let's actually break down operations even further. There's two kind of there's two types of of operations work going on. One of them is platform engineering, right? So there are teams that are building and operating platform services, right? They're centralized teams. They look more like a product team, but they're building operational capabilities for the organization to, to consume. And then there's this new push towards, uh, towards SRE, uh, site reliability engineering, which is those are expert operators, right? We're empowering them to uh, have a much more disciplined kind of software development discipline-like approach to uh, running operations. And those become the expert operators. And those are being distributed to within in the teams, right? So by doing that, what they're doing is they're using the platform engineering to um, minimize the surface area that the operators need to, to, to worry about. So by distributing the operators into the application teams and providing them with the platform capabilities, the amount of knowledge they need to have is, 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 is shrinking while a lot of it is being taken, is being taken by these, these, this product-driven platform organization. Um, the folks at Disney, um, they talk a lot about how they're moving to this, to this, uh, to this model. Um, Sean Norris at Standard Chartered Bank, which is one of the biggest banks in the world that's not in the, in the U.S., uh, was based out of Singapore, um, was, was uh, also uh, you know, moving their entire organization in this path, that taking this idea of the traditional operations organization, breaking into either it's platform engineering, which is centralized, or um, SRE, which is uh, distributed. And then people are taking the idea of, hey, you know, there's these new views on escalations, right? That um, Jody, Mas Jody Mulkey was the CTO at Ticketmaster. Um, now he's at GoodRx. Uh, you know, that was one of the early proponents of support at the edge. How do we push control closer to the people um, who, uh, uh, who, who need to take action? So how do we avoid the escalation altogether? Uh, John Hall, who's the product manager at BMC for Remedy, of all things, um, brings this idea of swarming, right? Which is, well, the escalations we can't avoid. Um, instead of doing these long escalation chains um, that, we're, that we're used to, um, you know, is, is uh, bringing this idea that came from the physical customer service world called swarming. 
um, to uh, you know shorten those escalate those escalation chains and solve the problems quicker. So a lot of push towards getting rid of escalations, empowering people closest to the problem, and you see a lot of of of, uh, of push out there to um, once we have to escalate, how do we either pinpoint the escalation or use more of this swarming technique to to make them to make them shorter. Which kind of brings us to the next part here, which is take action, right? And there's two types of actions we got to do once people get mobilized and in the right place to do something. Number one is di diagnosis, right? So how do we do the health checks, the exploratory actions to figure out what's actually going on here, right? Some of that's pulling in that observability and monitoring tools. A lot of it is, you know, just um, hunting around to figure out what's, what's actually going on. And then there's the restore actions, right? Restarts, repair, repairs, rollback. What do we got to do to get this service back? back online. And um, a long time ago, we had this idea of runbooks, right? That there was these, you know, it was mostly manual, they're wikis, they're binders, right? They're actual books that, you know, that would tell people procedures, try this, then try that. Um, and then we kind of saw this weird thing where the idea of runbooks, except in the largest of enterprises, kind of disappeared, right? That there was this configuration management world was going to take over and we wouldn't need, uh, you know, human intervention and operations. Uh, luckily, uh, run books are back thanks to the SRE movement. You know, Google and other kind of SRE adherents talk a lot about the value of run books. But instead of having this physical document that people have to follow, they're talking about automation. How do we how do we build automated run books that can either be triggered automatically or more or more likely by a human responding to uh, to a problem to diagnose or resolve uh, resolve something. And so, if you want to think about what run book automation really is, it's the safe self service access to the expert knowledge, right? It's not a problem of having not having enough automation or not enough tools. The problem is only a few people in the organization know how to actually use those tools, right? Or have the security permissions to use those tools. So instead, we end up with this point where we have to keep escalating up to those people. So the self-service is not just having a script, right? The self-service is how do you know how to the right, what right options to put, where to run it, when to run it, in what sequence, um, what nodes you need to target, that sort of uh, that sort of thing. How do you take that knowledge? And, and encapsulate it in something that, that's, uh, that's self-service and has the right guardrails around it so other people can take, can take action. Uh, something that my colleagues and I focus a lot, um, a lot on. And uh, again, the knowledge, because moving the bits is the easy part, self-service because you want to empower those closest to the action. Safe, meaning that it's not just safe to run it, um, but it can be safe from the security and compliance perspective. People are constrained to the right, to, the right, um, uh, to things they're allowed to but also safe from the, um, the execution perspective, right? That if I put the right guardrails in place that people can only make smart choices, right? Um, or the choices already made for them so they don't have to, um, you know, the risk of fat fingering things or doing the wrong thing at the wrong time is taken, uh, is taken away. So, um, you know, before runbook automation, a situation where, all right, you know, level one got the alert, got the ticket, and then what are they doing, right? They're generally got three options. One is they're, in, they're, they're dumpster diving. They're in the wiki, right? They're reading the wiki, trying to figure out, well, uh, is this run book correct? Who wrote this? What's that person trying to say? Oh, wait a minute. Look how old this date is. Is this still, is this still correct, right? Or they're trying to, you know, okay, I got the scripts in my directory. Is it the most latest version of the script? Where do I get the new one? Is it, wait a minute, it was dash I or was it dash E? You know, or, oh, is my node list up to date, right? So this kind of ad hoc usage. So what ended up happening is the most popular option to be this escalation option, right? That, oh, let's just escalate it off to somebody, to somebody else. And now we're pushing all that interruption, disruption in the organization and incidents taking longer to, uh, to resolve. So with runbook automation for incident management, it's about how do we create those automated procedures from the existing scripts and tools and APIs we're going to use? And how do we put them into the hands of those initial responders so they can have shorter incidents to solve them quicker? And also not have to escalate and up into the organization and cause a whole bunch of cascading uh, <clears throat> disruptions, right? So I would take the knowledge of the, and the capabilities of those experts, not everything, but you know the, the kind of core functions that they can do in responding to an incident, and put them in the hands of a wide variety of folks in our organization to move quicker, right? And a couple quick examples um, before I wrap it up here, you know, the idea of that before runbook automation, right? We had these. Escalation change. Oh, well, there's a problem with this with this service, right? So now I'm going to call the the L1 goes out. Oh, there's a problem here. So they they page the on call for that service, right? And that on call goes, yeah, this looks like an application error, right? And they page the 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 app team. And the app team goes, I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm not getting any data. This looks like a database problem. You know, they get the DBA team thinking they're going to fix it, and they go, wait a minute, this isn't a deep, this isn't a database problem. This is a network problem. That's why you're not getting any any uh, 
any data or it's, it's, it's timing out, right? So these long chains that, you know, maybe for a 15 minute fix still might take an hour or two to get the right person um, assembled, even if it's the right, you know, high priority. And all these people have been escalated to, they're being interrupted, right? Their, their other work is, uh, is uh, suffering, stuff we want them to do to move the business forward. So, you know, like example of, um, well, if we had a, uh, a, 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 some unknown problem, right? We got some packet loss. Well, if we're empowering this person with the right runbook automation to run the diagnostic commands that all those people in that chain would have done anyways, they can pinpoint and say, ah, there's a network latency problem. Let's pinpoint it, you know, let's escalate it directly to that, that network team, right? Or even better, maybe it's a known problem. Maybe there's, there's like a database lock, there's a bug, right? And, and we can run those diagnostic commands from that, you know, that runbook automation. And they go, ah, it's the database lock problem. They can run the, uh, you know, the remediation uh, job to, uh, to go and fix it themselves. No escalation required. You know, these kinds of situations, like 80, 90% uh, reduction in, you know, in uh, the, time, the time to repair because I'm empowering people closest to the, uh, to the problem. And from the individual perspective, it's like, well, at these subject matter experts, they're getting bombarded with everything, right? There's, you know, someone needs something, they've got a, want, uh, they've got a question for them, they need help with something. And all these little instances, right, we're pushing interruptions into the organization and, you know, they're causing some waiting uh, at the same time. So interruptions and waiting going on, you know, throughout the organization, overloading and burning out our key folks who can't get to the other work that they need to do to move, you know, the interesting stuff to actually move the business forward. Versus using runbook automation, it, it's, it's, it's creating these self-service capabilities to say, hey, you can do it yourself. Here's the, you want to check performance? Here's the job. You want to you know, do a restart, here's the job. You need to update the catalog, here's the job. You need, you know, so on and so forth. You need to reprovision a test environment, here's the job to do it, right? And by doing that, these people are no longer waiting, they're happier, and they're able to, to, to uh, get their work done on their own without interrupting somebody else. And so, so subject matter experts, they can focus on moving the business forward. And, you know, it also solves this very pragmatic problem. It's like, oh, we're gonna go to this new you build it, you run it model. We want developers to take care of their applications in production. Right. It's like, well, how are we going to do that? Right. Um, you know, in the old model, it's like, well, we'd have to open a ticket and escalate it up to uh, somebody in operations who can do it for us. With Runbook Automation, we see this time and time again, the compliance teams actually, they love it because they're like, well, I'm not giving direct access to an environment. I'm giving direct, I'm giving access to a named procedure. When Dutch shows you a, a demo, you'll get, uh, you get what that means. And we can also treat these things like code. So no longer doing that, that wiki, you know, trying to interpret human documentation is never kept up to date, but we can get development teams and, or anybody who's building parts of these systems to create their own, uh, their, own, um, their, own, their own runbook automation jobs and then put it through a code review like anything else, promote it to the right environments. The whole thing's very, you know, very traceable. Um, and, you know, uh, there's um, a lot of great examples kind of, bubbling up from forward thinking organizations. Um, uh, Bhavik Gupta from Capital One uh, has given some great presentations on how they've built their own custom uh, platforms for doing just that to say, they want to have a, a, a rules where as many rules as possible, they build the run books, the monitoring tool will uh, uh, first try the run books. If it triggers a match, they'll run the run book. If there's no match, they'll be able to pinpoint the escalation to who the correct on, on call is. And then that on-call uh, will help drive through the organization to build more runbooks, right? So they're going even more advanced with this, which is let's not even, let's not even, let's use it to enhance the, uh, the humans, but let's also try to avoid even, even waking up the humans um, in the first place uh, by building this into this uh, runbook automation uh, platform. You can look up uh, Bobic and these, uh, the presentations they've given on, it's very, very interesting. And then, so the last part about this, this uh, incident management cycle is the learning, right? And I want to go back to those system safety folks. John Allspaw is one of the people that's doing a lot of good work translating. He's, he, uh, he used to run technology at Etsy and at Flickr. And uh, now he's, uh, he's gotten his master's in these uh, human safety and system safety with those uh, uh, esteemed academics I mentioned before. And they're really working on bringing this back. And one of the key things they talk about is learning, right? That, you know, in the past with incident management, you know, you know what was the post review? Oh, well, maybe we'll do some gathering of information and we'll get together, but everyone was always focused on how do I get to these action items, right? Just give me the list of what you're gonna do so that never happens again. And um, you know, we think the value is here in the action items, but the reality is that John likes to point out a lot and I think his work is great and people should, should, should look him up, is that it's actually the learning, right? In these complex world, it's actually educating the people in the organization as to 
how things worked, why they worked, what happened, um, the journey towards figuring out uh, what went wrong um, during an incident is actually more important than those action items. Because often those action items, uh, they've done some research on this, cause more problems, right? So uh, because the action items are kind of done in isolation and, and the organization is not learning from those mistakes. So uh, they have this great quote, um, which, uh, sorry, I went backwards there. Um, and the great uh, quote is, Incidents are unplanned investments, right? It's bound to happen, right? We're in this complex world, things are going to fail. So it is an unplanned investment that you're gonna to have to incur anytime something breaks. You don't know what's gonna happen, but the money's gonna be spent. Now the question is, the ROI is up to you, right? How are you gonna learn from that? How are you gonna drive that learnings through that cycle? So um, you know, we get better at, 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 solving, uh, at solving these problems quickly and, uh, and effectively. So that's my, uh, that's my portion of the, uh, the day's, uh, today's presentation. Uh, I think I went a little bit long. Uh, hopefully everybody's, uh, everybody's still there. Um, if you got any questions, great. If not, we can jump right into, uh, for the sake of time, we can jump right into uh, Dutch is going to give you a demo of, uh, of um, some uh, runbook automation with Run, Run Deck. We do have one question. Hold on. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this. This is, uh, this is awesome. Um, I, I, quick question, just, just with where you feel like Runbook fits in uh, to the landscape right now, right? Like, uh, compared to contrast, let's say, like a stack uh, uh, form discussion, they thought automation or equitable power integrated with like a manager three platforms, whatever, right? Yeah. That you talked about. What do you think the wheelhouse is uh, for Runbook? Well, yeah. So what I would say with runbook automation in general, it's a layer above your other automation, right? So um, moving the bits is the easy part, right? So getting something configured, uh, pushing a package from point A to point B or hitting an API, like that's pretty much solved, right? There's pick your poison how you want to, how you want to do it. Runbook automation is about really the human to tool interaction. So there's knowledge of how I need to invoke and coordinate all those different things. So uh, the runbook is really that layer, right? The runbook automation is that layer. So it's really workflow across um, your, various, your various tools. Um, it's not really about replacing, this is really our design philosophy from the Rundeck side I'm bringing up now. It's not about replacing your existing automation or even the manual system commands that you would type in. It's about how do you capture those into the, work, the right workflows and then put the right guardrails around it, like security, um, you know, how do you, give people the right, um, you're presenting the right user input choices, uh, you know, validation, notifications, air handling. Um, how do you build those guardrails around that job and then have the right access control to give it to this, the right person to go and, to go and do it? Um, that's the runbook automation layer. Um, it's about communicating or, or delegating the ability to have the expert expertise to know how to use all those tools to do a specific named, uh, named procedure. And, you know, you can use a lot of things for runbook automation, right? I mean, you could make your own, you can bend other automation tools to kind of be that same interface. Um, so, you know, I think that's our perspective is we're just trying to focus purely on that layer, um, you, you know, but you can have different approaches to, to try to accomplish the same thing. And we have one more question, and then we're going to let Dutch get on to his presentation because he's already down to 20 minutes. So. Sure. Okay. So it seems to me you started out by, by pointing out part of the problem was finding out or getting a hold of the subject matter expert. There are a few people in the organization who seem to know the particular systems that are failing. I don't see the diagram you're looking at here, how that is that addresses the point of. We only have one key person who really knows how that system works. I'm sorry, it was, it was kind of hard to echo. So you said there, there is, I heard the part about there's only one person that knows how something works. John, maybe you can repeat it. Closer to the mic. Could you hear him repeat the question, Damon? No, can you repeat that? Okay. He's going to come over to the mic so we don't. Sure. I think part of it is I'm sitting right below a speaker. Hmm. Okay, um, very short. How do you address the problem of subject matter expertise? If you only have one or two people who really knows one of these particular subsystems that you're depending on, yeah. how does observation, reaction, and learning, and, and all these iterative processes help on that? Yeah, well, 
They may still be on vacation. That's what I'm my point is. Sure, sure. I mean, there's there's there, there's two parts, right? There's the bottom half here, which is the which is the learning, right? Which is uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about a second. The first half is how do we actually empower people? So there's there's two types of things that subject matter expert knows how to do. Number one, they know how to tell whether or not that system is healthy or not. Um, and number two, they know what the different things are that you could do to recover, to, you know, to, to restart it, to clear a cache, to recover from a known error, to do a rollback, to... So I think we lost you guys, but um, I unmuted the laptop. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying that that, that subject matter expert knows two things that's very useful in this top half, which is number one, they know whether this thing's healthy or not. Right, they know how to what all things to check to see if that thing's if it's if it's if it's if it's healthy. And then number two, they also know um, all the basic, all the ways you need you, you can you can you can manipulate that thing. Right, how to restart it, how to um, do a rollback or to a previous version, how to change a configuration, how to you know how to recover from a known a known error state. So the idea is, you know, how do you take those basic procedures and um, encapsulate them in automation that other people can use? to perform these steps, right? Now, you're not gonna get everything, right? But you can get a big chunk of it to which, because a lot of times it's the same repetitive requests, right? It's like, oh, I just did this in this environment, I got in this environment. It's the same kind of, you know, repetitive things happen over and over again. So how do you take as many of those repetitive, um, um, uh, whether it's a diagnostic or a repair action and encapsulate them into automation that we can then push to other people in the organization who, you know, have, may have great technical expertise, but don't have expertise in that particular, particular area. So that, that solves the, how do we get a shorter incident and how do, we, how do we cut down on those escalations because we're able to distribute control. But then the very important part why I brought up the John Allspa stuff is we have to have formal procedures in place to learn from those problems. It can't just be, I push this off to somebody else and now nobody else, now I'm just, you know, it, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm absolved from this. That's part of this learning process that has to change, which it's not just go write a test or here's an action item but it's how do we as an organization get smarter about how our systems work and feed that back into those subject matter experts who can then update those procedures um, and distribute control to more, to, more, to more people. Thank you very much. No problem. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'm gonna flip it over to Dutch because uh, uh, I'm eating up his time. <laughs> so. yeah, and just for people in the room, um, Dutch is one of their support engineers, probably their senior support engineer. Um, he's got 20 years of industry experience doing software development, database admin, infrastructure, architecture. Hey, thanks, Dana. Thanks, John. Can everybody hear me okay? So, uh, All right, Dutch, uh, we're ready for you to go whenever you want. Hey, excellent. So we're going to talk about Rundeck, but we're going to talk about Rundeck specifically in the context of um, an SRE named Alice. Alice started working at a financial services company about 10 years ago. Uh, the company had been deep-rooted in running um, a mainframe application for years, green screen. Only people at the company could work with it. Um, they had some Lotus Notes applications, but they wanted to start diving into building web applications. And this is the company's first foray into building out a Linux infrastructure. So Alice starts small. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize you were still here. Um, <laughs> keep going, Doug. Okay. Yeah, so Alice started small with this company 10 years ago, uh, building out a very basic a handful of Linux servers, um, a couple of web servers, you know, maybe for development, one for stage, one for production. She's running a database server, and maybe she introduced her new employer to Jira for ticketing and to help, you know, with the agile development process that they're starting to implement. You fast forward about four years, um, Alice starts getting more and more work to do. She's setting up more servers. Now she's brought in a Jenkins server. Maybe she's brought in the full Atlassian stack. She's running Bitbucket, Crucible, Fisheye, Bamboo, um, potentially looking at moving to GitLab. Throughout this process, she started in, in implementing DevOps practices. She's uh, writing infrastructure as code. Maybe she started out with Puppet in the process of improving her processes and moving to Ansible. Um, she's very efficient in her work, and there's a lot of work that can get done. 
but she has all of these systems that she's responsible for. So rather than, you know, maybe a dozen servers over the previous five years, now she's managing 60 servers or 70 servers or literally 120 servers. She's brought in HA proxy. She's got multiple database servers and clusters. She's in charge of keeping the applications up and running. Um, disaster recovery, doing database backups and restorations. Um, she has a high workload. Well, being responsible for this entire infrastructure, she's the subject matter expert in everything. And when something needs to be done, if a web server goes down, you know, somebody's gonna call in the support center, they're gonna escalate it up to the developers, the developers are gonna say, I don't know what's going on, let's call Alice. Well, while Alice is sitting here working on migrating something like Jenkins or Bamboo to GitLab to improve her processes, she now has to stop her flow. There's people waiting for her to take action and she has this interruption that she's gonna to have to take care of this urgent matter and come back to her other work later. Well, you know, it's not just this interruption. Maybe somebody that's a business analyst um, needs her to add a user to the web API. You know, these requests keep adding up and adding up. Alice can't get to the work that she wants to, comp to accomplish. And in the meantime, you have this queue of people that are waiting. Well, Alice runs in this tool called Rundeck. And what she starts doing initially is taking these tasks that maybe she had done from the command line, she starts writing these jobs. So when somebody comes to her, she can just log into Rundeck and um, you know, look at a job, produce a status, and maybe restart a job. So Alice starts very simple. She starts with her web application. And one of the first jobs that she writes is a diagnosis job. When she goes into Rundeck, she'll run the server diagnostics job. And this will give her an output of this web application that, that she's in charge of maintaining. Uh, it checks the database, it checks the HA proxy, it's gonna check my Nginx servers, and it's also gonna check the Node.js um, processes on these servers. And if we find out right here, we now have an issue. Okay, one of the servers is not working as behaved. The next thing that she does is she does, uh, she writes a couple of jobs. One job, she can re restart the entire stack, the database, the proxy, uh, the application servers in Node.js, or she can run a job that targets an individual server. If we take a look at the output of the job that we just ran, I do wanna see which server that it was that had the issue. That did not produce it. Um, we'll run this di diagnostics job one more time. You know, she doesn't, from this, she doesn't have to SSH into a server, dig around. Uh, these are all the commands that she would normally run. She would do this over and over again, which makes it right for automation. I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to restart this web server. And the web server that we're going to start, uh, by default, we can specify nodes. This would target both of them. I can override a node filter. And this right here tells me that, you know, Nginx1 is the one that's unhealthy based on a health check. So I'm going to override this filter real quick. Run this against Nginx01. This is going to restart the Nginx web server as well as the Node.js process on the server. I don't have to bring down the entire application. And if we come back and run our diagnostics job, what we'll see is we'll see that that issue is resolved. Now that Alice has automated this work for her, she can expose this kind of diagnosis and uh, remediation to members of other teams like the development team. And as this runs, we'll notice that all my checks pass and this job's successful and we're back in business with our web server. So what Alice does is she starts looking at permissions in Rundeck and I'm gonna jump over, this is the same server. I'm logged in as a different user, uh, Carlos. Carlos is on the development team. And you'll notice that Carlos doesn't have access to everything of all the jobs that, that are in this Rundeck project. So Carlos can come through when there's an issue with the server, he can run the same diagnostics job and he can run the same restart web application jobs within Rundeck itself. The next order of work that, Alex, that Alice has is, you know, um, every time a business analyst needs to have a user added to the web application, you know, maybe it's a 
external user that uses the company's products. Um, you know, that's a manual process that, that Alice has to go in and maybe manually add that user to her database. Well, from here, she creates a job that's going to add, you, add a user to the API. Once we go into this job, you know, we can, with our jobs, we can add options to them. Um, Alice would go in, create these options, create the backend step in the job itself. Um, and then add users. Maybe she does this for a couple of weeks and just like the development team, she goes, hey, why can I expose this to our business users? And what we'll see is, um, let's see, Duff is done. Carlos, the business user is gonna log in. And then he's gonna go to the Zimbax project and then what Carlos is gonna see is the ability to add users to a web API, the ability to list users. So this is going to output the users from the from it as from the API endpoint. Or Carlos could also uh, maybe there's an issue with the partner catalog and they need to rebuild that. Carlos could go in now. This would require Carlos to know the password to the database to run this, and he can decide which catalogs he wants to rebuild. And once he puts that in there, we're going to run this job. This is going to uh, rebuild the catalogs. The, the anatomy of a job in RunDec, uh, jobs are composed of job steps. So if we take a look at this restart web app job, um, it's going to run all the restarts for all the services that we have for our web application. Uh, in this case, this job's going to restart the DB, restart Nginx, restart Node.js, and then do a check status. Anything that can be done in RunDeck, um, these are all job step plugins. Uh, we have command plugins, script plugins. Uh, those basically do those actions. Uh, it would move that script or command to a remote node and execute that on a remote node. Um, we have a handful of other plugins built into Rundeck, but the fact that these are plugins, anybody that uses Rundeck in their environment or infrastructure, they can very easily write their own plugins. And their own plugins, job step plugins, don't have to be, you know, you don't have to know Grails or Java. You can actually write them in a language that you're familiar with, like Ruby, Perl, Python, um, or even Bash. The, the, the biggest benefit that, and Damien covered it a little bit, that you have with uh, Rundeck is that when you run these jobs, when users run these jobs, you kind of have a auditing functionality that you can see who, who ran what jobs, when they ran it, and what those jobs did. If we take a look here at the activity for this project, we can see that Carlos ran the catalog rebuild job. If we go into this, we can see what options he chose when he uh, he chose the options for the catalogs, country roles, and users. We can see what he ran, and we can also see what servers that this ran on. Um, a common practice with Rundeck itself, you know, um, you might have somebody that's managing a cloud infrastructure like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, and maybe you have something that you want users to do, but you don't want to give them access to that entire infrastructure. You don't want to give them access to the AWS console and then trying to figure out how to lock that down. Well, you can easily take run deck and create run books that have automation for those infrastructures. And you can even combine it with using something like Ansible. Um, Ansible has modules with rich interactions with those platforms. You could write your Ansible playbooks. Maybe you automated what needs to be done in an Ansible playbook, but you don't want to give somebody else access to that Ansible playbook. You can dial that into run deck. And to show you an example here with Ansible, um, we could have a playbook or a runbook that's going to call an Ansible task. And in this case, this one's going to run an inline playbook. It's going to call the Ansible module. This is going to create a Route 53 record. If I were to go into this job and run it, Let me back out of it for a second. 
if I were to sit here and run this job, and I want to create a CNAME record, this is going to run this Ansible task and create this record in uh, Route 53. And what we'll see here in AWS you'll notice down here this test entry is the one that it just that I just created with um, Rundeck running an in, in Ansible task. Uh, one of the nice things about Rundeck itself is that you can take everything that is in Rundeck you can write a rich ACL policy that determines who has access to what so you notice we had a BizOps user that we limited access to the BizOps group. Uh, we have a developer that we gave access to, di to diagnose and repair. Uh, the only repair jobs that they could see were restart and web app and restart web server. Those included references to these restart jobs here in addition to some other steps that they ran. But they didn't see you know, the jobs that are under this platform group. They only saw the jobs that they needed to run. If we take a look at the restart web app job, we'll notice that this comes in. Um, and we actually looked at this one a minute ago. You know, these are the job steps that it runs. Um, Run deck itself, you know, you have a concept of projects and jobs. There's also a concept of nodes. Uh, for this project, we have database nodes, um, MySQL node, we have a couple of web nodes here as well. These nodes have attributes that we've defined. Uh, this one says this one runs the Nginx service. They also have tags. That's what you see up here are the tags themselves. Um, nodes can be, you could have a, an attribute like environment for dev, maybe one for QA, one for um, production. And just like we can limit access to the jobs in Rundeck itself, we can even limit access to groups of users and what nodes that they can uh, connect against. Maybe the developers, we want to allow them to restart the web application for dev and QA, but we don't want them to touch or have the ability to restart the web application for production, we can control that with a control policy in Rundeck itself. Um, just, I'll touch on this real quick. You know, how does Rundeck know about your nodes? What do your nodes come from? Uh, nodes can be defined with YAML as it is in this project, but if you are using um, anything like ServiceNow, you could use ServiceNow CMDB to source nodes. You could use EC2 to define the nodes for your project, including adding filters so you don't pull in everything. Uh, you can base nodes dynamically off an Ansible inventory. Uh, you could even use Kubernetes pods as a node uh, resource model for Rundeck or even VMware. And if there's something that you wanted to do to dynamically add nodes into Rundeck, and you know we don't have a plugin built in for that, you could also write your own plugin that maybe reaches out to a database or maybe an API endpoint, and it'll load those nodes into Rundeck for you as well. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there support for SSM agents instead of just SSH? Or, uh, did you hear, did you that, hear that, Doug? I did not. Could you please repeat it? Is there support for AP for REST? SSM agent in AWS, as opposed to SSH. So currently we don't have support for SSM agents built into Rundeck itself. Um, when a Rundeck, when Rundeck connects to a remote node, um, just like the node, node resource sources and job steps, um, the connecting to a remote node uh, uses a, a plugin. Uh, by default, you can have SSH that connects to a remote node. Uh, you can use, uh, what, you know, if you're connecting to Windows, we have a Windows RM node executor. You can make it script based. Um, you can use Ansible. We also have the a plugin that allows you to use a jump host or a bastion host to connect, to, to move through the connect to the node that you ultimately want to connect to. Um, right now, we currently don't have support for a node executor that uses SSM. You could potentially write your own, or um, there might be a way to handle it through script execution, but I'm not sure. And while these, and I'll make this point here, while these node executors themselves 
are part of the project definition. Now this is the default for the project itself. Anytime that I do edit a node, um, I can, for an individual node, I can, you know, by default, this one's going to use SSH. If I wanted this one to use OpenSSH, I could easily specify a different um, node executor for this one. So if you were to write, uh, my point with this is if you were to write a plugin that did SSM connections to the nodes on AWS, you could specify individually on the nodes that you want to use SSM for. Another question. Do you usually see more uh, developers and SMEs using this, or do you see more uh, the outside? Did you catch that? I didn't. Could you please repeat it? The question was Is Rundeck geared more towards operations or de developer? I'd say it's geared more towards operations. You know, um, typically you're going to have uh let, let's say a subject matter expert who you know as as it was mentioned in a previous question about somebody who is the expert on on the processes or the infrastructure and you're always going to that person what rundeck allows you to do is to take their expertise and make rundeck the tool of the expert rather than that person because now all those processes are documented in runbook and uh, rundeck itself through you know writing runbooks yeah, I mean, this, this is this is Damon. I think most people come to it from it's an operations tool, and um, it's often when developers and subject matter experts come into it, it's more like I need access into this particular thing. So, uh, it usually starts with the operations. They start to give access to developers and other folks through this, and then they go, "Hey, that's pretty cool. I could use that too, <laughs> right?" Um, and that's generally how it how it how it spreads. Right, um, and yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, access to Rundeck is only used by ops and developers. You could easily have jobs in Rundeck that maybe you give access to somebody in the finance department. Maybe there's a nightly batch that runs in Rundeck that reaches out and runs 20 plus steps against uh, a billing application. And so rather than reporting to maybe a product owner that's in the finance department every single day on how those batch jobs run, you could give that person access to Rundeck and they could see what the statuses are for themselves. Maybe they don't have the ability to run the jobs. They can only read the jobs and read the activity. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, in, in incident management tends to be the thing that we see people justifying the investment with, right? You know, why are we going to do this effort? Well, shorter incidents, fewer escalations, you know, oh, that's great. Let's get that done. And then once it's in, it kind of becomes a Swiss army knife <laughs> that we see. Oh, there's a lot of these, a lot of these, these tasks that just like, oh, wow, you know, self-service would really work excellent here. And uh, so let's use our self-service tool to get it done. That answered the question. Any other questions? Okay, I, gentlemen, I thank you both very much for your time. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Damon. It was, a, it, was a, it was our pleasure. It was actually, it was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for having us. Really early for this, so I definitely appreciate that. Um, if I, if you have any other questions, email me, I'm going to give you an email in a minute and I can pass them on and get them answered. So again, I thank you both for your time and joining us and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Yeah. Thanks for having thank us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thanks everybody. Have a good day. All right. Bye guys.